So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Amkraut. I'm the executive director of the Laura and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the session of our 2018 Northeast Ohio Public Policy Series. Uh, tonight's program addresses redistricting and voting rights in Ohio. Uh, before I introduce our moderator for tonight's panel, I want to recognize and thank a few organizations who are especially instrumental in making our overall series possible. Uh, we have a number of program partners, uh, including the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University, the League of Women Voters, Cleveland.com, the Cuyahoga County Public Library, Cleveland Heights University Heights Public Library, and the Lakewood Public Library. Uh, we are, as always, grateful to our corporate sponsor, First Interstate Properties, for supporting this series. Uh, I want to remind everyone about some upcoming sessions before we get into it tonight. Uh, August 29th, there will be a session on Ohio schools report cards. That will be at Cleveland Heights High School. August 30th, on waste and recycling in Cuyahoga County. That will be at the Fairview Park branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. And September 12th, on Ohio gun laws, what are our options at the Tinkhamville University Center on the campus of Case Western Reserve University. Uh, there are flyers on the table outside uh, for the upcoming programs, uh, and we are scheduled actually uh, through the rest of the fall season. So you can uh, please check out our website, uh, cwru.edu slash lifelong learning. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that this is a panel discussion, and we do ask everyone uh, really to put their questions for us on their note cards and to refrain from interrupting uh, our panelists or our moderator uh, during the session. There is time set aside uh, for the Q&A later in the evening. Uh, so without further ado, it is with great pleasure that we welcome Tom Suttis, the ed an editorial writer at Cleveland.com, uh, who will uh, be our moderator for this evening, and he will introduce our panelists. Uh, Tom is a columnist on Ohio politics for the Cleveland Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com, the Columbus Dispatch, Dayton Daily News, and other newspapers. He is associate editor and member of the Plain Dealer Editorial Board, and he teaches journalism at the Ohio University E.W. Scripps School of Journalism, and he was elected to the Cleveland Journalism Hall of Fame. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Tom Suttis. Thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. It's a special pleasure to be here because, first of all, I'm in Greater Cleveland, which I always enjoy being in. Secondly, because of the public interest and public matters that you, ladies and gentlemen, reflect by being here this evening. And thirdly, because it was about two years ago on the 25th in a few days that we had a similar panel with Ms. Clyde and Mr. Uh, Senator, <laughs> Senator, Senator LaRose which proved to be a very successful event as well, which is why we're doing this again. So let me talk a little bit about the event, and we'll get right to some questions of our panel members and a discussion with you, ladies and gentlemen, later on in the evening's schedule. Yes, my boss printed this in large type so I could see it without glasses. Um, before I introduce our panel members, a bit of background. Tonight's event is a policy forum, as, as Brian said, a discussion on voting on Ohio, not a candidate's night as such. We will be taking questions later. Obviously, it happens to be the case that two of our candidate panelists are candidates for statewide office, but they're here tonight not because they're candidates, but because of their demonstrated knowledge of the General Assembly members of elections and voting matters and state law in that field. Um, they're very familiar with all these issues that we'll talk about this evening. Two legislators on the panel were also invited because they were kind enough to take part in this event two years ago, and it proved to be so engaged, en engaging that we wanted to have it again. Now, about our guests in alphabetical order, Representative Kathleen Clyde of Kent represents the 75th Ohio House District, which includes central and southern Portage County. Representative Clyde earned a bachelor's degree at Wesleyan University and a law degree at Ohio State University's Moritz College of Law. She also earned a summer fellowship to study election law at New York University's Brennan Center for Justice, the study of election law. She's ranking Democrat of the Ohio House's Committee on Government Accountability and Oversight. She's a Democratic nominee this year for Ohio Secretary of State, who is the Ohio's Chief Election Officer. Tom, Thank the closer to the microphone. Sorry. Maybe I should sit. Big enough anyway.
Thank you for being here, Ms. Clyde. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm really together tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, in alphabetical order, Dr. David B. Cohen is a professor of political science at the University of Akron. He is also assistant director of the university's Raymond C. Bliss Institute of Applied Politics, which I think is a very fine program, by the way, for what my opinion is worth. Um, Dr. Cohen attended, uh, earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, his uh, master's degree at the University of Tennessee, and a PhD in political science at the University of South Carolina. Uh, I'm intrigued by one of a selected topics course Dr. Cohen has taught, which is entitled American Campaigns and Elections in Film, which sounds really good to me. I wish I could be enrolled in that myself. Well, I do a list for you of all Dr. Cohen's scholarly publications. I suspect we'd all be here till late tonight. But I particularly recommend to you, everyone, a book that Dr. Cohen co-authored, uh, Buckeye Battleground. Sorry about that. It's empty, fortunately. Buckeye Battleground, um, Ohio Campaigns and Elections in the 21st Century. It's very engrossing material. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for being here with us this evening. Senator Frank LaRose of Hudson represents the 27th Ohio Senate District which includes parts of Summit County, parts of Stark County, and all of Wayne County. Um, Senator LaRose, who was an Eagle Scout, enlisted in the Army after graduating from Copley High School. He served in Special Forces, and his deployments included Iraq and Kosovo. His commendations and recognitions include the Bronze Star. Senator LaRose is chair of the Ohio Senate's Transportation, Commerce, and Workforce Committee. Mr. LaRose is the Republican nominee for Secretary of State of Ohio, as I indicated. That is, of course, Ohio's chief election officer. Uh, incidentally, besides Representative Clyde, Senator LaRose, also running for Secretary of State this year is a Libertarian candidate. His name is Dustin Nana, N-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A of Delaware. Thank you, Mr. LaRose, for being with us this evening. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Um, both candidates. Thank you. <laughs> They're giving up. Valuable campaign time to be with us this evening, and I know how much that's, I appreciate that. I think I'll start with uh, Professor Cohen uh, to talk a little bit about an issue that these legislators are familiar with and the voters have acted on, but it still has a lot of impl implications for, of interest to all of us, and that is the question of apportioning fairly the legislature and congressional districts. Um, and Dr. Cohen will talk us a little bit about that with us this evening first. Go, take it away. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Thank you, Tom. Um, first of all, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, the League for, for inviting me and for uh, uh, being uh, between two uh, of what I think are, are very bright lights in their respective parties um, and uh, what I hope will be an informative panel. Um, I'm surprised uh, that the room is filled because politics is so boring these days. <laughs> you know, usually I'm speaking to empty chairs, so uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> No, I think it's a little too interesting uh, these days. But anyways, um, I digress. Uh, and I also want to say about the book, which came out in 2011, I have to give credit to my colleague Dan Coffey uh, and uh, my colleague John Green, uh, who happens to be the, the interim president of the University of Akron. Uh, they were the real drivers uh, behind, that, uh, behind that book. I did contribute, uh, but they are the intellectual power behind uh, Buckeye Battleground, which is a fabulous book. Um, let me... Let me just kick off this uh, panel by focusing on some remarks of, uh, on what I believe is the most important voting issue in Ohio, and that is redistricting and, and gerrymandering. Um, I think, in, in my opinion, no issue uh, in recent history has impacted the political destiny uh, of the state or really of the country. Um, every 10 years, for those of you that are unfamiliar, every 10 years, um, the United States government, the federal government, engages in a census. Uh, and when the results are into the census and, and they're certified uh, and the United States House is reapportioned, uh, in other words, determining how many uh, seats each state gets, um, state legislative and U.S. congressional districts, you know, have to be redrawn, redrawn in order to uh, take, um, take account of the changes. For example, uh, we already know, based on the fact that Ohio isn't growing as fast as some of the other states in the country, we're going to lose one congressional district, unfortunately. So we're going to go from 16 to 15. That has to be taken into account uh, when they uh, redraw uh, the districts. And so this process happens every 10 years. It happened in 2011. It's going to happen again in 2021. 
Uh, and because of gerrymandering, or as Senator LaRose likes to remind me every single time I say it, gerrymandering, which is the proper way to say it, um, but I'm going with the popular way. Uh, <laughs> because of gerrymandering, um, uh, the process can and does determine the partisan fate of states all across the country, and did so to great effect uh, in 2012 in Ohio. There's just no denying that. What is gerrymandering? Well, put simply, um, gerrymandering is the manipulation of legislative district boundaries um, in order to grant an electoral advantage for a particular party or group. Uh, it's taking the lines, drawing them in a particular way so that uh, one party uh, or the other or one group or the other uh, has an advantage uh, during an election. Um, partisan gerrymandering, uh, which is to do it uh, for a particular party, is in my opinion particularly anti-democratic. Uh, and it allows the political party in power to choose its voters instead of the voters having a fair shot at choosing, choosing their representatives. Uh, and I think everything starts from there, because if you don't have fair elections, if you don't have a, a, a fair uh, competitive shot, uh, then, then all the rest of the issues that we're going to talk about uh, are really extraneous, uh, in my opinion. As an illustration, after the 2012 election, uh, which was the first to occur after the 2011 redistricting process here in Ohio. Ohio's 16 U.S. House seats were held by 12 Republicans uh, and four Democrats. And so I'm not very good at math, uh, but I can figure it out. 75% Republicans, 25% Democrats. And this is a swing state which President Obama won twice, uh, and yet you have one party controlling 75% of the congressional seats. Something's not quite right there. And this ratio has remained unchanged since the 2012 election. Uh, and we see the same thing with the Ohio legislature. Um, gerrymandering is, is, is an issue. You know, we have uh, 33 total Senate seats, 24 controlled by Republicans, 9 controlled by Democrats. On the House side, 99 total seats, 66 controlled by the Republicans, 33% by the Democrats. Uh, and it's not just a problem in Ohio. This is, this is not an Ohio problem. It is uh, a problem in many states across the country. And it sounds like I'm picking on the Republican Party. I'm really not. This is not a Republican Party created uh, issue. Um, you know, there are states uh, across the country that have Democratic gerrymanders, Illinois and Maryland, uh, for example. In fact, in the 20th century, uh, Democrats actually benefited um, nationally from the process of redistricting and gerrymandering. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why Democrats were in power in the House of Representatives for 45 straight years. Uh, it, it is because of this um, uh, ability to, to draw the maps in such a way. In fact, let me quote President Ronald Reagan, February 15th, 1987, complaining, um, and he says, the fact is gerrymandering has become a national scandal the Democratic-controlled state legislatures have so rigged the electoral process that the will of the people cannot be heard. They vote Republican, but elect Democrats. A look at the district line shows how corrupt the whole process has become. The congressional map is a horror show of grotesque, contorted shapes. Uh, districts jump back and forth over mountain ranges, cross large bodies of water, send out little tentacles to absorb special communities and ensure safe seats. But it's, it isn't just the district lines. The Democrats have been out of shape. It's the American values of fair play and decency. So it was an issue back in the 1980s, and uh, things have not gotten better. In fact, they've gotten worse because today's technology allows map drawers to draw lines with microscopic precision, going neighborhood by neighborhood, house by house. Uh, and uh, Republicans have been much more savvy in the 21st century, uh, like Democrats were more savvy in the 20th century uh, at doing it. President Obama complained in February of 2016, the fact is today technology allows parties in power to precision draw constituencies so that the opposition supporters are packed into as few districts as possible. And one of the interesting things is only recently uh, have a sizable number of citizens and journalists started to pay attention to this important topic. Uh, people working in the political process understood it, but it's only recently that you have people, uh, regular citizens, journalists, that are actually starting to pay attention to this very mundane topic, but an absolutely crucial one. Um, and, you know, I'll, uh, for my Congress course that I teach, I'll spend three weeks on the topic of apportionment and redistricting. And my students, their eyes are glazing over. They're like, my God, please stop. <laughs> but it's critical to understanding uh, the functioning of Congress and American state legislatures. Uh, in order to understand that process, you have to understand the, the draw, uh, redrawing process uh, in the first place. And so, and, and to, to finish up, 
this is actually a success story here in Ohio. Uh, we're actually making progress, and, and the League of Women Voters, other groups are to be commended for putting pressure uh, on the state legislature, and the state legislature is to be commended uh, for willing to be uh, for being willing to address this very difficult topic in a time of uh, Republican trifecta control. I mean, Republicans didn't need to do anything about gerrymandering uh, or redistricting because they controlled all the levers of power. So. Um, it, you know, both parties, the legislature, they need to be com uh, commended for, for coming together. Um, we had initiatives passed in 2015 and 2018 here, which significantly altered the process. Um, and uh, these two are much better equipped to actually talk about uh, what it is that they did and how they, they arrived uh, at that place uh, than I am. Um, but I, I, I wanted to start on a positive note because, you know, there's a lot of negativity uh, in politics recently, and, and with good reason. Uh, but I think the work that was done in the Ohio legislature needs to be highlighted and talked uh, 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 about a lot more uh, because you know there is the hope of uh, actual bipartisanship on this issue. Thank you so much. Let's ask our legislators, first Ms. Clyde and then Mr. LaRose, with their comments on the outlook on apportionment and redistricting. They both voted for these measures, as did the voters of the state uh, and referenda. And so what are you optimistic, pessimistic, or so-so about the future, given these measures have been taken? First Ms. Clyde and then Mr. LaRose. Uh, thank you, Tom. And, and of course, thank you to the League for having us here and the Plain Dealer. Uh, it's an honor to sit on the panel uh, with these two gentlemen. Our process for drawing districts is, is so broken in this state. And as a member of the legislature, uh, I've really seen the damage that it does uh, in our country and, and in our state, uh, pushing legislators to the extremes, creating polarization, and creating legislation from our state house that isn't what the majority of Ohioans want to see their leaders doing. Uh, so I am very pleased that we were able to come together and uh, put these two uh, measures before the Ohio voters. Uh, they're not perfect. Uh, I think that uh, this is the type of reform that we need to do in an incremental way. And I think that this is a great first step forward for the first time in Ohio history there will be language in our Ohio Constitution that says partisan gerrymandering has no place in the process of drawing our districts. That's a huge win for all Ohioans. I was so glad to be a part of that process in the legislature. And I feel hopeful for the future in these reforms. Senator? Thank you, Tom. And, and uh, likewise, I want to thank the Plain Dealer, uh, Case Western Reserve, League of Women Voters, and, and my fellow panelists for being part of this. And this is such an important conversation. As Dr. Cohen pointed out, sometimes uh, we feel like we've been, uh, you know, uh, preaching the, the need to do redistricting reform for a long time, and, and folks weren't, weren't hearing it. Uh, but uh, that wasn't true. Um, way back in the 1970s, the League of Women Voters started working on this issue in the state of Ohio in the 1980s. They got very active on it uh, and, and have, have carried that banner ever since. Um, when I first arrived in the state legislature in 2011, this was one of the things I really wanted to work on. And I got the question constantly from people, why the heck would you want to change what's worked well for your party, uh -huh. right? And people said, oh, you know, leave well enough alone, LaRose, stop causing trouble. And, and my answer was always very simple, though. My priority is not what's best for one party or the other. It's what's best for Ohio's democracy, for the for the uh, the civic life of of, of our state, and, and furthermore, the way that district lines are drawn has caused trouble in the state of Ohio, and it doesn't meet the expectations of Ohioans. Uh, as we've seen, it has caused polarization. It's caused divisiveness, unnecessarily so. Uh, and it's also been a winner-take-all proposition. For, for, for uh, long uh, periods of history, whichever party could control the pen uh, did so uh, in a way that benefited them politically. And, and it would have been expected to, to do that, right? Republicans have, Democratic, Democratic uh, leaders have as well. And so uh, when we were finally able to come together and get both state legislative redistricting reform done uh, back in 2015, and then again this year, finally, get congressional redistricting reform done, um, it was something that, that, that was a, a time for rejoicing, I think, for a lot of Ohioans. Now, the question is, how will it work? 
right? We've created a better system. Uh, we have created a system that requires consensus and compromise, which is not a dirty word, by the way. It's how statesmen and women solve problems in our form of government. And so in 2021, the next time we draw district lines, it's going to depend on the people that are empowered to carry that process out faithfully in the spirit that it was drafted in the spirit that over 75 percent of ohioans came out to support it and by the way those thousands of people wielding clipboards from the league of women voters uh, from folks like common cause ohio ohio environmental council municipal league and so many others that held our feet to the fire so that we could finally get something done it's a big victory for ohio but we'll see in a few years if we can carry it out faithfully and that's what my hope is Thank you. I think we can all acknowledge something about this. The, the possibility of something like this happening in Washington, uh, where the, both parties came together and got something done. Maybe it's not ideal, maybe it's not perfect, but it showed real progress. I am by no means a Pollyanna, as my readers would know for well from reading me over the years. But to me, this was an interesting, interesting, I thought maybe almost cultural transformation. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just because they were worried about a court decision. I don't know. But it is a contrast. You know, someone, a governor of Ohio once wrote a memoir and said his motto should be he wanted to have constructive government for Ohio. And I think this kind of consensus with the voters ratifying it showed there was some consensus reached in different, very different political perspectives, which is a refreshing change. We think we can all agree about that. And, and ratifying it overwhelmingly. Yeah. Pardon me? Ratifying it overwhelmingly. Right. These things didn't just, uh, yes. just sneak by. We're Land talking slice. 71%, yeah. 75%. That's uh, correct. Yes, that's, that's also very notable. Yeah. Now, I have some questions for the panelists, and I'm going to ask each one a question. And if one of the other panelists wishes to supplement with an additional answer to that question, he or she should feel free to do so at the end of the other person's giving his or her reply. So my first question is for um, Representative Clyde. Uh, and anyone else who wants to add to what she has to say about this. The National Conference of State Legislatures at least says at least 22 states have some form of postal voting. And I guess I'd categorize mailed in Ohio absentee ballots as a kind of postal voting. According to the NCSL, as of January last year, the latest reference I could find, three of 22 states, Oregon in 2000, Washington State in 2011, and Colorado in 2013, hold all elections by mail. Uh, in your opinion and your work on these issues, studying them as a legislator, would that be desirable? And if yes, if it is desirable, feasible for Ohio, postal voting for our elections? And what do you, what's your take on that? Uh, thanks, Tom. And I am happy to see the mail-in voting that we have in our state now and the amount of voters that are increasingly uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to vote absentee uh, by mail, uh, maybe from the comfort of their kitchen table where they have the ballot, have time to make careful considerations and then mail it in uh, before election day. Going to vote by mail, I think is something that we really ought to consider in Ohio. Uh, there's some really interesting data that we're seeing uh, coming from uh, states that have, have been kind of the, the leads. Uh, you know, one advantage to it is it puts a ballot in everyone's hands. Uh, and the opportunity then uh, to work to get those ballots back in, uh, it, it's an exciting proposition. And we do see that states that have adopted it have seen an increase in voter turnout. And to me, that that is a goal that we should all be striving towards. Uh, so I'm, I like it for that reason. Uh, I also could save the state money. That's something that I'm looking into of, you know, not having to have as many polling places open on election day, uh, potentially not needing to recruit tens of thousands of poll workers uh, that if you talk to board of election officials, uh, like I do often, it's hard to recruit all those folks to work for a long day for barely any pay. So it would help us solve that problem. But we need to do careful study into uh, communities that maybe are distrustful of uh, voting by mail uh, and of you know entrusting their fundamental right uh, through the Postal Service, away from you know, their, their common way of how we usually vote. Uh, we also need to make sure that we have a better system in Ohio for ensuring that everyone is registered to vote. Because if we have a state that is 
like Ohio that has been purging tens of thousands of Ohio voters because they have missed a few elections. And we go to vote by mail, who's, who's going to get the ballot? It'll be the list of registered voters. And right now, we have some serious problems with how we uh, handle voter registration in Ohio. I'd like to see us move to automatic voter registration, uh, but there are a number of improvements we can make. And I think we ought to look and do it. I really do. Mr. Rose? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, the representative makes some, some great points on this, and these are things that are worth worth looking at. Uh, the cost savings uh, could be substantial. Uh, the convenience to voters is a great thing. Uh, but I think that the system we have right now where there's a lot of different choices available uh, is a good one. Uh, my grandparents are here with us today, and they, they've, they've taken up uh, voting uh, by mail. And I know that my grandma will call me every now and then, and we'll talk through some of the choices. And that's one of the wonderful things about it is you can, you can think it out. It's on your kitchen table. You can flip Flip open your laptop and research these candidates a little bit more. Uh, you may not have that chance in the in the booth, obviously. Uh, and so, vote by mail is a great thing for Ohioans. The question, though, is to go to exclusively vote by mail uh, would be, I think, probably not the right step for Ohio. What you find is that for some folks, filling out those bubble forms is a challenge with the the sort of dexterity questions or or, or whatever else. Um, and and there's also a there's a cultural uh, uh, aspect to voting yeah. where people enjoy coming out and seeing their, their neighbors at the local community center and whatever else and participating in that. Uh, things like weekend voting that are now part of our culture in Ohio with early voting are a great thing. And, and, and faith groups come out together to vote on Sunday afternoon. And that, that sort of in-person voting uh, is, a, is a good thing. Um, I, I think that what we ought to do is grow vote by mail in Ohio. And, and, and one way that I've proposed to do that, to make more uh, people aware of it and engaged in it, is to simply put that, uh, that application online. Right now, mm -hmm. you have to fill out a form, you have to print it out or go get it from your board of elections, you fold it up and mail it in and they get it and they open it up and spread it out and they type in your information and then they mail you a ballot and everything else. There is no reason why that simple little form can't be put on the internet. I introduced a bill that does that so that voters can, from their smartphone, from their laptop, they can just go and request their absentee ballot without having to lick an envelope. And uh, and, and that would be just another step forward, uh, something that we could do to, to, to make it easier to vote in Ohio. Doctor? I think everybody's anti-licking stamps <laughs> and envelopes, right? Uh, so anything that allows us to avoid that is good. Um, but uh, more seriously, I think anything that increases um, the ease uh, for people to be able to vote and the convenience is going to increase voter participation. I think that is a goal. I think that I think the three of us um, wholly support. Um, and, uh, you know... I would go further than just uh, vote by mail. I mean, most of us in this room have a smartphone. Um, I, I do my banking through my smartphone. It takes me a couple of minutes uh, at the most. Uh, it's convenient. Uh, I don't dread doing it like I used to. Uh, you put all the crap on the kitchen table, go through all the bills, write out the checks, lick the envelopes, uh, and, uh, and all that. It, it's, it's a much easier process. Um, the technology is there. Now, of course, we have to worry about things, and we can talk about this later, worry about things like election security. But, you know, the technology is there for people to be able to uh, vote uh, through their smartphone, through their computer, if they want to continue to vote in person to, to do that. Uh, one thing we should talk about, I think, is same-day registration. We, we also know that people who are registered to vote vote and um, are, are much more inclined uh, to then go ahead uh, and to vote. So if, if we make it easy for people to show up at the polls on election day, show their license uh, and a couple other things, there's going to be an incentive for, uh, for people to do that. Let me, let me give you one anecdote. When I was in college in Wisconsin back in the 1980s, the first uh, election I ever voted in for governor, which was 1986, something like that, 88, can't remember, um, 87, somewhere. Uh, we have same we have same day registration in Wisconsin. As a college student, I didn't even know that. I just showed up, uh, and I'm like, hey, I'm here to vote. Uh, I knew nothing about the the rules or anything. And they're like, well, you have to go get a gas bill. Uh, so I went back to my apartment, got a gas bill, showed my license, I registered to vote, and I was able to actually um, to vote. Uh, and I voted in every election since. Uh, that's a good thing um, uh, for, for people to have that uh, possibility. 
I do believe, I think Ohio's constitution presently forbids same-day registration, but of course it would require an amendment. I have to mention something one of the panelists mentioned is so true about the cultural aspects of voting, going to vote. Um, I'm from Northeast Ohio, I'm proud to say from Youngstown, kind of a, a working class family. My mother was very proud to work at the polls every, as a Board of Elections worker. And um, you also may remember at the time that it was illegal in Ohio to have the, the saloons open or bars open, you couldn't buy liquor when it was voting was going on. I guess on the assumption people would get that bought a vote for getting a drink. And uh, my family was by no means prudish and they weren't teetotalers. They just were good ordinary people, I think. I'm not sure how I turned out the way I did. <laughs> and mother came home and she was a little bit out of sorts. And I said, we well, always enjoy election day. She said, I know, she said, and I did. And we had, and of course people then would wear dresses and everything when they were going to work at the polls. And, and she said, you know, so-and-so who was the committeeman came by at 6.30 in the morning opened his trunk and had a bottle of scotch and a bottle of vodka and a bottle of gin and a bottle of whatever. And he said, quote, would your girls like a drink? <laughs> 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 and my mother realized and think she could be taken with someone to have a drink at 6.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. let alone to the trunk of someone's car. So let's, but it was a, a, an annual thing and they look forward to actually going physically to the polls. So Tom, is that a reform you're proposing? Free, free alcohol? <laughs> At the polls? I do not support that. Okay. <laughs> but, like, can, I, can I just say one more thing? Uh, another success story here in Ohio, and that is the fact that people can register to vote online now. Um, and well, let me, another, guess, yeah. another anecdote. Uh, my 18-year-old son, who turned 18 in the spring, um, I said, instead of going down to the Board of Elections, let's try this out, because it's a new thing. Uh, he, we, we opened up the computer, and he registered to vote in less than five minutes. Uh, and, and it was amazing because um, there was no dropping it at the Board of Elections or at the DMV or anything like that, it, doing it by hand. Uh, just a, a couple of clicks, filling out some information, and he was done. And I think m once more people know about this, yeah. I think uh, more, especially the younger generation, will, will register to vote. This time we'll start a question with Mr. LaRose first, and then any others who wish to jump in, please do so. Um, obviously, the needs and wants of Ohio's own voters are paramount. Um, what, in your view, would be the pluses and minuses of selecting Ohio's presidential electors by districts uh, or pro rata by presidential candidates share of Ohio's popular vote? As you know, uh, we Maine and Nebraska do that now. I elect their electors by congressional districts, and then the presidential candidate winning the state gets the two electoral votes representing, in effect, the United States senator. Just as an example, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, had Ohio had this system in 2016, we would have cast um, uh, three votes, electoral votes for representatives for Secretary Clinton, the remainder for Mr. Uh, Trump for the, um, for the presidency. I'm not sure the outcome nationally, because I didn't take that into account. Does that sound like something we should explore as a state, electing congressional or presidential electors by district? Yeah, this is the, the, the topic that seems to come up every four years, it does. Tom, and, and it's kind of the, the, the favorite uh, parlor discussion for people that think about uh, these kind of things a lot like we do, those of us that are academics or journalists or, or, or legislators. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always open to studying something like that, but the idea uh, just uh, sort of off, the, off the, the top of my head doesn't sound like something that I would be pushing for. I, I'd say this, that there are some pros and cons. There are very few states that do it that way. You mentioned Nebraska, and I think- and Maine. Made. Yes, sir. It, it may tend to over uh, weigh uh, uh, rural versus urban and, and cause sort of those kind of disparities depending on the way the district lines are drawn. And as we've all established, we've got, uh, thankfully, a better process for drawing district lines so that, um, well, the next presidential election, they'll still be the current districts. But the one after that, there'll be a new set of districts drawn under a much better system. But it, it could create that. And, and also, it could create a scenario where candidates come to Ohio for the presidency and only campaign in one mm -hmm. or two select congressional districts and sort of disregard the rest of the state. I like the idea that Ohioans as a whole, everything from the lake to the river, we come together with one voice to select our president, uh, our candidate for president, our, our electors, if you will, for the electoral college, uh, and, and not do it this district by that. I think that it um, it could be a little bit too parochial. I think that a, a decision like this, selecting who the person is, uh, who he or she is, who's going to be the uh, commander in chief of our country, uh, and and, uh, and that should be done as a collective. Uh, the whole state of Ohio makes that decision. Ms. Clyde, do you have an, uh, any particular take on this possibility? I think that the the congressional district idea right. in a state like ours with a lot of congressional different districts, which is different than Maine and Nebraska, 
And with our districts as gerrymandered as they are, it, it's just a, a frightening prospect uh, for us to to go to. I think there are advantages and disadvantages to uh, the pro rata approach. Uh, you know, first of all, we would want not want to be the only state doing that. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we would need to see other states uh, participating in that reform, or it, it would count Ohio right. out in a way during presidential elections. Uh, it also could be, you know, we're a swing state. We get a lot of visits. Uh, you know, we could be ignored uh, during a presidential election. Or uh, people who aren't from swing states, you know, now feel that they're ignored or that their vote doesn't matter uh, when it comes to the presidency. So there's a lot of things to weigh. And I think, you know, we should look for a national approach to this. Yeah. Uh, and it's certainly uh, something that I'm open to, to continuing that conversation. It just Thank you. needs um, to be more broad. I, I should mention the three districts that voted for our uh, Ms. Clinton were Marsha Fudge's district here in this part of the state. Uh, Tim Ryan's district, which encompasses part of Akron, also the Youngstown area, represented the Joyce Beatty's in central Ohio. Those three districts were cast their presidential vote in the aggregate for, for her over Mr. Trump. The other districts all voted for Mr. Trump in the aggregate. I th oh, can I, can I just yes, make sir. a... And you hear about the congressional district plan uh, a lot, and I think it's the single worst idea uh, proposed for reforming the Electoral College. Um, I'm just not, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Uh, it, we've, we've done studies in 2012 that the Congressional District Plan had been in. Mitt Romney would have won the presidency, even though Barack Obama uh, won a, a pretty significant electoral uh, victory and popular vote victory. Um, and the reason it doesn't work is because congressional districts are gerrymandered, which is how we started off this panel. Uh, you know, if you had fair districts, maybe a system like that could work. And yes, it is true that it is the uh, you know Nebraska and Maine do split up uh, their their electoral votes that way. But let's face it, nobody really lives in Nebraska uh, or Maine, <laughs> so. Nobody really cares. Uh, I mean, you can I mean say that. I'm just, I'm, to be honest, I mean, if, if it was Florida that was doing this, then it'd be like, well, now it's going to have an impact. Uh, but it's Nebraska, for God's sake. Right. So, okay. I forget that job offer at the University of Nebraska. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah. This question will start with Representative Clyde on this one. And um, I think all three of you will have something to say about this. And I, I, it's, it's, it's complex and it isn't partisan, but it certainly has to do with. Uh, Oh, procedures by elections. Um, should the General Assembly, um, excuse me, are, are the, 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 the hurdles or the requisites for either statewide issues going on the ballot or for independent or third party candidates qualifying for the ballot? A general question, I realize. In general, are they about right? They need some fine tuning or maybe they're just okay the way they are. What's your take on that, Representative Clyde? Well, this is something that I've been involved in over the years as, as we've looked at this and seen uh, the dark money flowing into Ohio when some of our issue campaigns have uh, come forward. And, you know, Ohio citizens are feeling like you can buy your way uh, to the constitution of our state, uh, whether it be uh, casino measures that have been considered or the prescription drug issue that we saw uh, a huge amount of spending of dark money uh, in that race. I think we, we have to find a way to make sure that we're protecting the rights of the citizens to come together uh, to push needed reform especially uh, in a government right now where it's completely controlled by one party and where the state house has, uh, you know, is completely controlled by one party because of uh, these gerrymandered districts. We have to find that balance. And I don't think we have found it yet. Uh, as far as third parties, you know, there, th there are advantages and disadvantages to improving access to third party candidates to the ballot. I would say the advantage is that it could present voters another option. Uh, and also, 
you know, maybe one day we will get past this mainly two party system. Uh, and that is something that, you know, we, we, uh, you know, may see in our lifetimes. Uh, but the disadvantages can be uh, the gaming of the third party system and where uh, major party candidates uh, may recruit candidates that are, uh, you know, if you're a Republican candidate, you may want to see a progressive third party candidate in a race to take votes away from your opponent. And that can flip the other way as well uh, for Democratic uh, candidates. And I don't want to see that gaming of the system. And what you can end up with there is a winner of the election who is not the majority choice. And that's concerning to me. Uh, but we, we got to keep working. And I hope, I hope we can get that ballot issue balance right, because uh, I think it's critically important. Mr. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So uh, first of all, regarding the minor party candidates, I think that uh, we always have to be careful to err on the side of ballot access, right? I mean, we don't want to find a scenario where, where too high of a bar has been set so that, um, you know, eligible Ohioans who want to seek office under maybe a title other than Republican or Democrat, well, you know, we, we ought to, to make sure that they have the access to, to do that. Uh, but at the same time, the, the issues that the representative raises are, are, are valid ones because there can be that kind of gamesmanship from time to time. In, in an ideal system, in an ideal uh, manifestation of our system, I guess it would say the two-party system that we have uh, function as coalition parties, large big tent parties uh, versus sort of the parliamentary system where there are 15 different parties and you can select the one to be a member of that, that sort of meets your narrow ideological band. But even after that, after an election, there has to be a coalition formed to get to 51 percent to govern. Uh, and so when the Republican and Democratic parties are at their best, they're big tent parties. They, they, they welcome uh, folks uh, along the, the ideological spectrum spectrum into their ranks. Uh, but, you know, I, I, would, uh, I would say that, that uh, when we make adjustments to those systems, we need to make sure that we err on the side of ballot access. As it relates to uh, referendum and initiative and, and making sure that, uh, that folks have the right to amend the Ohio Constitution, it's important that, uh, that those processes um, also be thoughtful because, uh, as the representative pointed out, uh, there are a lot of things that are in the founding document, essentially, of our state that really don't belong there. Uh, you know, I, I've told people, think about what's in our Ohio Constitution, uh, the, the, the outline for our form of government, uh, the, the checks and balances that keep the different branches of the government accountable uh, to the people, uh, things like the right to vote, things like the, uh, the right to assemble, free speech, and, and, and freedom of the press, uh, and casinos and marijuana and or attempted or you know all these right. other things that really just don't belong in a constitution that sh that stuff should be handled through statute um and, and so uh, perhaps the bar is too low as it relates to constitutional amendments but the right of the people for referendum and petition uh, to, to change their government is, is is also sacred so we have to you know find that balance dr cohen i mean i, I agree uh, i agree with uh, uh both of my colleagues here i think it should be hard uh, to get on the ballot, but not impossible. Um, but it should be hard uh, because we have a two-party system, uh, whether people like it or not. Uh, we have a two-party system in the state. We have a two-party system uh, at the federal level. Um, and the, the hard reality is third parties serve only one purpose uh, when you have a third-party candidate ballot, and that is they're a spoiler. Uh, and they can, they can change the result of an election. One need only, if you want to take a national example, look at the 2000 election. Uh, Ralph Nader's, uh, the, the amount of votes that Ralph Nader got in Florida um, uh, changed the result of the f uh, Florida election and, and resulted uh, in the, uh, the party much further away from the Green Party uh, of being elected. And so um, I, think, I think it should be difficult. It should be difficult to get an issue on the ballots because you have to show that you, you can build enough support and enough legitimacy out there to be able to get it on statewide um, so that it actually has a chance. Uh, and and you know, amending the Constitution 
should be difficult. Yeah. Uh, it shouldn't be easy uh, because one of the reasons that we have a stable government, both at the federal level and the state level, is because change is very difficult. And the founders purposely built in uh, the complexity, the inefficiency, uh, so that a change would be difficult uh, and, and that it wouldn't be made hastily. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll start with Senator LaRose this time. Um, and this is a, a good question for any office holder, I think about any subject. If you and you alone could reform our states and our nation's campaign finance laws, what would you do? Yeah. You start with full transparency. And, and that means every dollar that's spent uh, to try to influence the outcome of an election. Um, and, and that's something that uh, I think, you know, Dr. Cohen was talking about how, how much redistricting reform has contributed to problems. I think that the, the evil twin of that, uh, of, of gerrymandering, is campaign finance. I think that the two things that have caused the most problems in our uh, system uh, of government over the last few decades uh, or longer uh, is the way that we finance campaigns uh, and the way that we draw district lines. And so, by the way, uh, obviously, uh, you know, both major parties are are are, are sort of playing by the, the same same rules as it relates to this one. Uh, and so, it's time that, that that we improve that. Now, in Ohio, campaign finance reform um, can can only affect so much, right? So, what we can do at the state level is make things more transparent uh, for Ohio elections. And and I've proposed a bill that does that for local elections. So we as candidates for statewide office or candidates for the state legislature, we file our report online. Uh, it's an Excel sheet. It's uploaded to the secretary's website. It's worked that way since roughly 2000. Works pretty well. Now, the website needs a refresh, but it, it works pretty well. And um, local candidates can't do that. It, it specifically says in statute they have to submit hard copy. And I know we've got some folks here that are elections workers. You get the, the candidates come up to the, to, the, to the counter at the Board of Elections with a stack of paper, and here's my campaign finance report. That's pretty outmoded. Uh, and the problem with that is those aren't searchable. They may scan it and put a PDF of it on their website, uh, but you can't search it. You can't search it by name or company donor name, et cetera. So for a journalist, for an academic, for a concerned citizen that wants to know who's funding local campaigns, uh, that information is hard to get. Um, and so the bill that I that I wrote that received bipartisan support in the in the Senate and, and now is pending in the House has had uh, uh, bipartisan support getting out of committee in the House. I believe it's pending uh, for, for action uh, on the House floor is, um, is finally going to address that and, and put that process online. So that's one thing that we can do. I'd love to see action at the federal level as it relates to some of these super PAC type groups and everything else. But again, um, you, you can't sort of unilaterally disarm on that. It, it's, it's a matter of uh, uh, leaders from both major parties coming together and saying, we need to fix this because the American people, the people of Ohio deserve better. Ms. Glad, if you ruled the world, so to speak, what would you do about campaign finance reform in Ohio and, and the federal statute? Well, I would like to see the legislation that I've proposed uh, which has not been given a hearing uh, to prohibit secret money in our state elections in Ohio and to ban foreign money in our elections in Ohio, get a hearing, uh, get serious attention, and become law in our state. Because we're really uh, seeing tens of millions of dollars poured into Ohio that we don't know we don't know who the contributor is. And what organizations do is set up shadow organizations. So the only thing, when you look at their finance report, you'll see is a, another LLC that's not reporting their contributors. So my legislation would require any entity that is doing political spending to disclose their donors, whether it's the, you know, or the issue campaign or the LLC that was set up to hide where the money was coming from, that couldn't happen anymore under these changes. And we're also seeing foreign money coming to those LLCs where we don't know their donors, and that foreign money is interfering with our elections here in Ohio. That's wrong, and I hope that we have the opportunity uh, to fix this big problem in our system. Dr. Cohen. I mean, I, who can be against full transparency uh, unless you're hiding something? Um, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, you can't. Uh, 
uh, fill out uh, the forms and, and report in rubles, because uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. Or Bitcoin. <laughs> right, yeah, or Bitcoin, exactly. Full transparency, it's a, it's a no-brainer, but the, the Supreme Court has, uh, with Citizens United and other um, uh, court cases, has really destroyed the campaign finance regime uh, that we were uh, working towards, I think, at the beginning uh, of the century with uh, McCain fine gold. There's a lot of problems with it, but it was, you know, the, the, the Congress was attempting uh, to, to wrap their heads around uh, or their hands around, around the problem. And the Supreme Court completely blew that up. Um, the fact that you have billionaires that can write checks or, or give cash donations for unlimited amounts of money and nobody will ever know who it was. How, how can you even begin to track not only um, who's giving what, but if foreign entities are actually getting involved? Um, you know, we, we've all read the reports about the NRA uh, and the money that, that they've gotten uh, from foreign entities, uh, the Russians, uh, and then uh, potentially have funneled it to candidates. H how, can, how can you track that uh, if the system doesn't allow uh, for, for any way to, to do so? So um, you, we knew this was going to be a problem back in 2012. You know, Mitt Romney said corporations uh, are, are people. Uh, that's kind of what the the um, court said, and it's just it's a broken system. And Senator LaRose is absolutely correct. These really are the twin evils in our system, uh, and that is uh, the the gerrymandering uh, and the um, uh, the campaign finance. And until those two issues are fixed. Uh, at least on the federal level, uh, our, our federal uh, government, our Congress, uh, will continue to be absolutely dysfunctional. Thank you. Um, this next question, actually, both uh, uh, of our two legislative panelists would have dealt with, actually, as legislators, in addition to being people interested in the Secretary of State's office. And it's one that affects every county in the state, and that is the physical machinery, the equipment, the techniques, the computers we use to um, register our votes when we go to the polls. And I assume this question is predicated properly. I'm not 100% sure myself, but uh, should the state, this starts with Ms. Clyde first, should the state uh, attempt to either mandate or persuade all 88 county boards to adopt the same system, the same equipment, machinery, and so forth, or not, in your view? Uh, thanks, Tom. I, the cybersecurity of our elections is such a critically important issue uh, that our state is facing. And we have some old voting equipment out there, uh, machines that are around 10 to 12 years old. Uh, if you think about what phone you had 12 years ago, it probably doesn't look a lot like the phone that you have today. Uh, this, this old technology is very vulnerable. Uh, so it's important for us uh, to do the upgrade. And I was uh, glad to work across the aisle with Senator LaRose uh, to get that funding out to counties to upgrade their machinery. I do believe that Ohio uh, should move to a paper ballot, uh, voter marked, voter verified paper ballot system. That is the most secure voting system that we currently have. Uh, here in our country. That's what many states are moving towards. I know you here in Cuyahoga County have that paper system, but about half of our county still have uh, electronic ballot uh, systems. So I wouldn't say which of the paper ballot systems need to, to be purchased, but as long as they are voter marked, voter verified paper ballot systems, we will be in the best shape uh, as we work hard to keep our elections secure. I've introduced legislation uh, to do that. Uh, I tried to amend legislation that we put forward to require that, uh, and that's something that I'll be pushing, hoping that we can get the counties, the rest of the counties, on board with a more secure system. Yeah, well, so the, the question of security is, is, is first and foremost uh, uh, one that uh, all of us need to be thinking about, elected officials, uh, local leaders, uh, and, and, and private citizens, uh, because uh, as we used to say when I was in the military, the, the bad guys, and I guess bad guys and gals, have to only be right once. 
Uh, the good ones have to be right every single day. And so it's constant vigilance. Uh, and what that means is updating systems, updating your, uh, your procedures, uh, and keeping the latest equipment. Uh, the equipment that we have right now was purchased in most cases uh, with money that came from the Help America Vote Act. Uh, in some cases, this is 15 and 20 year old technology. Some of the technology that's in those machines is, was, was old when it was, when it was purchased. Um, and so the time has come definitely to replace our voting machines. That's why we, 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 we worked on this bipartisan bill. I introduced and, and, and wrote and worked with the county commissioners and the Association of Elections officials, uh, and again, friends on, on both sides of the aisle to, to get that done. That's $114.5 million of funding. Uh, it's very fiscally responsible, by the way, and, and uh, was done very carefully to, to make sure that, uh, that it's uh, sustainable and, and in a way that, that helps the counties well. At the same time, uh, the counties have to, to, to sort of uh, bear uh, a little bit of the responsibility for, for that as well. We need to remember, though, that elections in Ohio and throughout the nation are not a statewide or nationwide activity. They are a county by county activity and county by county. And, and, and when we just start to think that there's no such thing as bipartisanship anymore, when Republicans and Democrats can't agree on what day of the week it is in every county in Ohio, every morning, Republicans and Democrats come to work together and they turn the lights on and they run fair elections side by side. I mean, that's a success story. And so I don't want to see us sit in Columbus and mandate what uh, type of machine a certain county uses. Other than to say what's been the standard in Ohio for 15 years is that there has to be a paper trail that's either voter verified or voter marked. Uh, it's shocking to me that there are still states in this country that have electronic voting with no paper trail. That's highly irresponsible. Um, in order to do a post-election audit, and, and I believe those should be what's called a risk-limiting audit, which is a, a better statistical technique, uh, you have to have a paper trail. And so whether that paper trail is generated as a voter-verified paper trail or whether that's something that the voter marks, uh, that decision should be made at the county level. A Republican and a Democrat board of election members, two Republicans, two Democrats, uh, duly appointed to that position, will make the decision about what kind of machines they want to buy. And the other problem about fielding one type of machine statewide, um, and, and there would be cost savings, right? If you, if you buy one machine for all 88 counties, you buy in greater volume, and, and there would be cost savings. But it also creates a vulnerability. Because remember, if something is wrong with that one type of machine, uh, then it's wrong in all 88 counties. Uh, right now, if you've got you know several different types of machines that have all passed certification at the federal level and the state level, uh, and the, and then each county gets to choose, that's that's the best scenario, and that's what I think that we ought to maintain. That's what our bill does. Uh, the, the the bill that I wrote to fund new voting machines allows the counties to make those decisions as long as they meet certain standards. One other thing about a voter mark ballot exclusively is again uh, that raises concerns with, uh, with with disability advocates and uh, those that advocate for the elderly because of uh, concerns about filling in the bubble. Um, and what I've been told is that, that that for some people, that's a challenge. There are ways to work work around that, I'm, I'm, I'm certain. Uh, but that's just one thing that needs to be taken into account so that every Ohioan can mark that ballot or, or, or touch that screen and not have to face sort of challenges to do that. I think it's only fair to mention. I'll ask either one of you to answer this if you choose to. Which, uh, If a county board of elections deadlocks due to two, who gets to break the tie? Secretary the Secretary of State. Of State. Secretary so. of State. But I also agree, uh, we get a lot of phone calls in our business about conspiracies and different types, and I happen to like that genre of, 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 of reporting, but I often think about the fact that you have a conspiracy, you'd have to have two Republicans, two Democrats on a given board of elections to make that happen. Yeah. And that's probably not likely in Ohio, any place I've ever been. Uh, we have a question. I just think we should do a tug of war. I don't think the Secretary of State has. <laughs> Has any business deciding that? <laughs> Be entertaining. Um, but I was, I was just going to say uh, that um, uh, clearly there has to be a common standard uh, among counties, and we do have 88 counties. It would be difficult to have one voting machine for, for the entire state, although it, it, it would uh, result in, in cost saving. Um, but I do worry, you know, I'm, I'm in, in one way I'm a futurist, and, and, I, and I do want to see, you know, the, the voting on the smartphone. There, there is no paper trail with that. Or maybe there is. Maybe you get a, uh, maybe you can figure something out and you get a, some sort of email back uh, with your receipt um, in, in some way. And so I, I, I think that we still need to look forward, uh, but also uh, focus on security as well. I have great respect for your point of view, but I actually worry more about 
Verizon and AT&T than I do about the Soviet state, so uh, in terms of corporate power, but that's just an aside. Yeah. We have questions now from members of the audience from the cards you filled out earlier, and this one I'd like to address first to Representative Clyde and then um, uh, Senator LaRose. And it's a very topical one. It's a lot of interest to lots of people all over the place. In your opinion, how do you think having the citizenship question on our census forms, we may not have it, we may or may not, if we do, will affect the results of redistricting data down the road? Because, of course, we have an census in 2020 and, and so forth. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, the citizenship question is, is problematic. Uh, it will... Uh, as we are hearing from communities around the state and the country, uh, it will discourage folks from filling out uh, the census forms, which so much information uh, and you know funding that we receive nationally, how we do redistricting in our state is based on that critically important census data. So we have never had that. Uh, question on the census form and decades of performing uh, high quality uh, counts of, of our people in this country. And I would hate to mess with that, uh, that good thing, uh, and, you know, make it harder to get an accurate count uh, in, in our country. That, that would do us all wrong. And I hope that there's now litigation going on yeah. to pro try to knock that off. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. I think it's an, an important uh, important problem that we need to address. Mr. LaRose. Yeah, the census is, is vitally important for a lot of reasons, not just redistricting, but the allocation of government benefits and funding and, and all sorts of things. Um, and, and, and the questions on the census do a lot more than tell us who, you know, how many people there are in a given jurisdiction. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm open to, to hearing both sides of this argument. It doesn't seem egregious to me to ask people, are you a U.S. citizen or not, uh, particularly if there's an opt-out option or, or leave it blank kind of option or something like that. But uh, if that's useful information to have. I need to hear a case for why uh, that's information that we need to ask on the census. But uh, again, uh, I've also heard the other side of this that, that, that um, uh, makes some valid points. But uh, to me, it seems like reasonable information that, that you would want to know uh, if you're doing a statistical, a once a decade statistical study of a nation uh, who is a citizen and, and who is not. Uh, seems like a valid piece of information to want to know. But again, I'm, I'm open minded to hearing both sides of this argument. You want me to jump in? David? Do you want me to jump in? Um, I, uh, I I think there's only one reason the, the question uh, is proposed to be on there, and it's, a, it's for political reasons. Um, and um, I, I understand Senator LaRose's point, you know, if there's an opt-out. I worry uh, with the current administration in place uh, that they would take that information if somebody opts out, uh, and then all of a sudden that information winds up in the hands of... Uh, of um, ICE uh, or other federal agencies, uh, we've all read uh, stories about uh, you know the the abuses uh, among some people, um, among some uh, ICE agents uh, that have occurred over the last uh, you know year or so. So I, I worry about where that data uh, would end up. I, I do think that it's it may be a reasonable question if the purpose of the question is to really get a handle on, on who's, uh, who's in the country, what kind of services we, uh, the government can provide, et cetera. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I don't really trust uh, at this point that the question is being asked uh, for utilitarian purposes. Here's a very good question I think one of, the reader, one of the attendees this evening suggested. And I know in one sense it's going to sound softball, but these uh, two legislators have campaigned for office now for the legislature. They're campaigning out for statewide office. And this is a question that must have crossed their radar because depending on the audience and the event and the day, they may encounter people that are very warm-hearted and uh, very open-minded, maybe others that are maybe not so much so, and advertising can be all over the map. And so at the risk of sounding mockish, I don't mean it this way. I think it's an important question. Um, I'll start with, Ms. with Representative Clyde this time because I've gotten mixed up in my sequence. Uh, I admit <laughs> it, my age is showing. Um, what can we do by we, I mean, as a people and then office holders and those seeking office do to try to recover or restore some civility in the way candidates and campaigns are conducted and conduct themselves. 
in your experience, you have lots of it. I mean, as a candidate, and both of you do. Yes, the civility in our country nationally, uh, from our White House uh, down to our State House, is is lost uh, in a lot of our uh, political arenas and political discussions. And uh, this is something that's been important to me as a legislator uh, is trying to, you know, have have a, a disagreement, uh, but you don't have to be disagreeable. You don't have to uh, name call. You don't have to uh, tweet offensive uh, material, uh, it, it, it's out of hand. And I've experienced some of that in our own state house uh, here in Ohio. And, you know, I think that both parties need to come together uh, and work towards a solution. Uh, and I think some of the systemic reforms that we need, like ending gerrymandering, uh, which will decrease the polarization, which will make both sides able to work better together, uh, is key. Um, but you know, we're at a sad moment right now uh, with what we're we're seeing uh, coming from Washington, and I hope that uh, you know I can be a part of a new generation of how we approach uh, our political conversations and political debates, Senator. Yeah, th thank you, Tom. This is, um, I was hoping somebody would ask this question because this is absolutely one of my favorite topics of conversation and something that I've really dedicated myself to. And it kind of goes back in some ways to my time in the military. I, I remember um, arriving at basic training and being there with a bunch of folks from all over the country, all walks of life. I mean, the, the full diversity of the United States sort of in that barracks. And almost instantly, all of that sort of went away, not in the sense of that we weren't proud of where we were from, but that sort of team environment of we're all here to work together. Um, I remember somebody said, you're, you know, here, meaning in the army, you're not black or white or Hispanic or whatever, you're all green, meaning you, you have a common purpose, you're, you're all part of a team. I was surprised to not find that, I guess I wasn't surprised, I was surprised by the level of uh, really the tribalism that exists when I arrived in, in, in the state legislature. Not that there are bad people there, there are really good people there, but all of the forces of nature are kind of built to pull you to one side or another, to, to get people to, to, to be loyal to this tribe or to that tribe so that you can get uh, to a certain threshold to get a vote or, or whatever else. And, and, and we as, as people that, that serve there really have to make our own efforts to push back against that and to try to cross the aisle. But you can be penalized for doing that. Um, you know, and, and I've seen that uh, with, with, with my, I've been, I've been penalized for reaching across the aisle. Um, but yeah. this is something that, that, that uh, my wife Lauren and I have talked about a lot. Uh, and, and, and I should mention, if I may, Tom, uh, Lauren is celebrating her birthday here with us tonight. So uh, this is uh, <laughs> nothing better than a, a, camp, a, a candidate forum with the League of Women Voters to celebrate a birthday. Yeah. But with our daughters, we, we, we talk about how you, I mean, this is something that any parent talks, I hope, talks about how you interact with one another. Be kind to each other, just basic human kindness. And um, I think that without being too philosophical, each generation of Americans has overcome a major problem, a major hurdle, whether it was uh, winning a, a world war, whether it was reuniting the country after the Civil War, whether it was ending uh, the, the, the scourge of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of slavery, whether it was um, the civil rights movement and finally realizing that 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 American idea of equality and all, all of these things have, have sort of been big milestones. I, I almost feel like our generation, those of us that are in government now and are coming into government, what our challenge is going to be over the next few decades is making our civic life work again, making uh, democracy work again in a way that people can come together and 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 find compromise without disliking one another uh, and, and I think that this is something that we can work toward it's a problem that's never solved right it's probably never a day where we say okay we fix civility we can move on to it but it is something that we can make strides toward I, I joined with a group called the National Institute for Civil Discourse it was formed at the University of Arizona after Congresswoman Giffords was shot and I serve as a national co-chair of their effort and we've traveled around the country 
offering training sessions for state legislators. And so it's fun to go to pick your state capital somewhere in the country and you bring Republicans and Democrats together and we go through this this workshop. And the first challenge is just getting people to take the armor off because that tribalism sort of comes into the room, that idea that I'm from the donkey tribe and I have to do war with the elephant tribe. And, and when you can get people to be humans uh, and actually talk to each other, we find out, ha, huh, we agree on a lot more than we disagree on. And I think that that is the, the nub of it and, and what we need to do as it relates to civility. Thank you, Senator. I'm going to ask David, from a perspective historically maybe on this, is it in fact incivility in absolute terms worse or have we gone through cycles in Ohio, in American politics where there have been times when it's been pretty raunchy and times when it hasn't been? Is this well, a new high or is this not a pistol I, duel? I just can't uh, get past Senator LaRose dragging his wife to a panel <laughs> on her birthday. <laughs> You're such a romantic. <laughs> um, it has been, um, at times, it has been very raunchy, yeah. you know, as you say. I mean, presidential politics, which is, which is my specialty, uh, you know, you, you look at the, the days of Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, um, Thomas Jefferson, it, it, was, it was pretty rough. Um, those elections uh, and and the way that the legislatures uh, functioned at that time. Uh, 20th century got much better. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you had a professional class of legislators, uh, and just let me, let me give you an example, you know, on the, on the federal level, um, you had uh, people that worked in the U.S. Congress uh, that would, once they were elected, they would move out to Washington, D.C., and the suburbs, uh, and they would move their families there, and their kids would go to private school together, um, and uh, they would socialize uh, in the evening during the yeah. week. Uh, it all comes back to, to beer, I guess, uh, and, and whiskey. Um, you know, they would, they would play poker together, and they got to know each other as individuals and as people, uh, and they would, it wouldn't be Democrats uh, uh, socializing with Democrats, Republicans socializing with Republicans. It would be members of Congress socializing with each other, and it would allow them to make deals. And it's a lot harder to dismiss people of the other party if you actually know them as people and you're friends with them. And I think we've lost that because now we have a commuter Congress. It's, a, it's the Tuesday to Thursday club. Uh, they come home on the weekends. You know, even, even members of Congress uh, from California uh, will come home uh, on the weekends. Uh, and, uh, it, it, and what it means is it's tribal. You, you, stick, with, you stick with your own team uh, and you don't get to know people uh, across the aisle. And I think that's... that's uh, a very bad thing. Um, now, uh, you know, here uh, on the state legislative level, it's, it's different, but I, I think both uh, of my colleagues on this panel have, have mentioned the fact that if you fix some of the structural issues, if you fix the gerrymandering issue, if you fix the campaign finance issue, it is going to make, um, uh, it's going to very much improve uh, the level of civility, uh, because let's face it, you know, when you're in a gerrymandered system and you, you, you're, the districts are utterly safe, you're not worried about your general election opponent. Um, the only thing that you're worried about is getting primaried, which means that you have an incentive as a legislator to move to the extremes in your party so that you don't encourage somebody to actually primary you. Um, and what that means is compromise, and dialogue is a dirty word, and it's used against you uh, in a primary. And the founders built a system that made compromise and dialogue necessary for, for getting things done. And we have a, a system that's incentivized the exact opposite. Well, certainly these legislators and their, many of their colleagues have shown you can do that under the right circumstances, such as the gerrymandering and apportionment uh, uh, issues. I should have mentioned, of course, those two issues that the voters approved were the co-sponsors of the two of them were a very uh, long-serving and very accomplished black Democrat from Akron, Senator Vernon Sykes, and I fair to say, a very conservative Republican from Lima, Allen County, Senator Matt Huffman. I mean, these are not, but they were able to collaborate. Again, I sound like Pollyanna, I'm not, but I want to mention something else just as a sidelight. Um, I used to hang around the legislature even when I was a college kid at Ohio State, which 
it's just more about me, I guess, than it is about the legislature. And uh, I've covered it off and on since 1983 uh, in September when Dick Celeste was just barely in office. And I can't give you data on this, but I can tell you incontestably the level of socializing among legislators of different parties has declined precipitously. I don't know all the reasons for it. Maybe certain bars that were favored bars closed. Someone said, ah, seriously, there were hangout bars. Yeah. Uh, someone said the, the ethics law of 1994-95 made it so burdensome to report hospitality, like drinks and meals at bars, that people just stopped going over there where the lobbyists were. But I can tell you, uh, some people you would never imagine could sit down at the same table and have a very constructive conversation, different racial backgrounds or heritages. Political heritages could do that then. I think it doesn't happen as much now. I'm not sure the reasons for it, but I know by observation it used to happen quite often. Well, and I, I think term limits probably haven't helped either, because when you have a, a revolving door and, and a lot of turnover, it's hard to establish those long-term relationships. Well, the other and, thing And you was, get rid of the institutional memory. Tom, I can tell you that, that uh, just anecdotally, that in my first couple of years there, um, there was a, a gentleman who served as the minority legal counsel, the lawyer for the Senate Democrats, and he said, hey, I, I've always wanted to join the military, and I'm thinking about becoming an Army lawyer. W would you sit down and tell me what you think about it? Because I had served yeah. in the Army 10 years. I, I had been with him uh, after session one day for maybe a half hour sitting at a, at a bar in downtown yeah. Columbus telling him, hey, this is what you expect in the Army. This is the good. This is the upside, the downside, all that. My phone started ringing. I was actually called into our chief of staff's office because I had been reported having drinks with someone from the other party. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the world it's become down there, yeah. I know, and I'm not surprised by that story at all. Yeah. And I can't tell you enough how, much, how damaging that really is because yeah. part of politics is consensus mm -hmm. about any issue. I don't think every issue can be a consensus. We can't be partly for or against certain crimes, but that, that's made a difference in budget, especially in framing budgets and so forth. This next question is from the audience. It is an opinion question. I grant you that. And it is an issue that's very salient, though. It's on the minds of lots of people. And these two legislators and Dr. Cohen know elections and election machinery and election procedures very well. Um, and um, again, this is a belief question. Uh, and I'm going to let anyone answer it first who wants to answer it. And then you can go in any order you want to. It's not off color or something, but it's, it's controversial. Uh, do you believe our elections? are being hacked or have been hacked by outside interests. Let's ask David first. He's a good neutral party here on that one. Um, Never thought of you as a neutral Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, Senator. Ha, um, hell if I know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I suspect it, uh, that there are attempts to hack our elections uh, and, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Ohio was one of the states or one of the places uh, that attempts were being made. I, I absolutely believe that foreign countries, especially Russia uh, and, and other countries, are, are attempting to uh, somehow influence our elections. Um, but I am not a, a cyber uh, a security expert. Um, that is simply my opinion, based on absolutely no knowledge. <laughs> what, what either you... Uh, legislators care to say much about that? Because I, I know it's an opinion question, and we don't necessarily have data to sure. answer it. But. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I would say that Ohio was targeted in 2016. It's, it's very uh, well known. Uh, our Secretary of State has uh, been open about it. Uh, we were one of 21 states uh, in the 2016 election. That was targeted by hackers, but they, from what we know, uh, we're not able to break through uh, our systems that we have in place then. Yeah. Uh, but we are getting intelligence uh, from both Republican and Democratic intelligence officials that the midterms are, you know, they are looking for ways to attack our future elections, which... You know, we, we need to learn our lesson from what happened in 2016 and really focus on, again, uh, you know, my cybersecurity plan would ensure that Ohio votes on voter marked, voter verified paper ballots, uh, that we have audits to make sure that those machines are working properly, and that we have a cybersecurity 
uh, director and bipartisan counsel advising that director in the Secretary of State's office to make sure that we are prepared for anything that they may throw at us. It's so important. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, were we hacked? And, and I think that the answer is, they tried. We think, we know they tried, right? Uh, the good news is, uh, and what, what folks need to hear, what voters need to hear, is that uh, no tallying of votes was changed. No, no tallying of votes was impacted by, by a hacker. We, we, we know that. Um, I visit a lot of county boards of elections right now, and I, I, as I'm traveling around the state, I make a point of stopping in because, again, in 88 counties, these are the men and women that do the work uh, on a daily basis. I was down in, um, over in uh, Trumbull County yesterday. They had a special election yesterday, so I wanted to see what they were doing related to that. And um, what you find is that the Republican and Democratic election workers that are there uh, are very dedicated to the work they do, very serious and purposeful about the work they do. And anybody that, 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 that has concerns should go visit their county board of elections and get a tour. What you'll learn is that the equipment that tabulates ballots is never connected to the internet. It's, it's not, uh, the only thing it's connected to is the power plug on the wall. Um, and, 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 and even the, 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 the USB drives that they use to transfer uh, the, 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 the election night data from the tabulation equipment to the machine that uploads it to the internet, those are then thrown away. The little $5 USB drive is never used again uh, because once it's been on an internet connected machine, it could never go back to the, So there's a lot of good processes in place, but we have to be vigilant constantly. Now, this question relates to the last question regarding yeah. civility, and here's why. Because what they were successful at doing is what we in the military used to call uh, information operations, propaganda. Uh, in the special operations community, we called it psychological warfare. And and you know what? Uh, 50 years ago, it was dropping pamphlets from an airplane or jamming radio uh, broadcasts or whatever else. Now it's Facebook, but it's the you know it, it's the same tact. It's the same tactics with a different different technique, different platform. And so as Americans. Uh, what we need to do to resist that kind of thing that, 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 that foreign actors would try to do is be more informed consumers of information. Uh, you know, journalists have a role to play, legislators, educators. We, we, can't re we can't believe everything we see on a screen. And um, this, these attempts have largely been designed to make us dislike one another. I mean, that's, that's largely what the, what the Russians were doing with their information operations on social media, to sow discontent to sow disbelief or confusion, uh, and to make us dislike one another. Let's not let yeah. them win. Our last question, because we have a few minutes, only a few minutes left, and this one, I think, says uh, a lot about someone who, in these candidates, do go into the arena and take some risk and give up their time and make themselves vulnerable to all kinds of things by doing that, uh, biting the bullet, so to speak, getting out there and offering themselves in public service. And so... Our question for in alphabetical order, Ms. Uh, Ms. Clyde and then uh, Mr. LaRose, uh, the candidates, this question's for them. Uh, who are your political heroes? <laughs> wow. I have a lot of political heroes, I will say, uh, but uh, I'll shout out uh, my mom, who's here in the audience tonight. Uh, she ran for village council in my hometown, a tiny town in Garrettsville. Uh, she and I campaigned together. Uh, I was a, a young college student, and that was the first campaign I, I ever worked on. And, you know, she showed me that uh, women can be elected mm. leaders, uh, you know, just like men can be. Uh, she was breaking gender barriers uh, and also serving the people, doing the right thing, bringing the community together. So she's my hero for a lot yeah. of reasons, yeah. but I'll say she's a, a political hero of mine as well. Mr. LaRose, uh, your you know, hero politically, <laughs> a political hero. I guess likewise, uh, for me, uh, my, my parents had a big impact on, on my life and my mother's here um, as, as well. Thank God for mothers, right? Like <laughs> seriously, for all of us. Uh, and, and I grew up in a bipartisan household. Oh, my mother's well, a Democrat. My father's a Republican. I hope to have, have uh, gotten the best <laughs> of, of both. Um, 
<laughs> and so the, those are heroes, but also those that have, uh, my, my parents have been heroes to me, but those that rise to the occasion in, in a time of, of trouble. I, I think of, um, you know, folks like, uh, like LBJ, for example, that, um, you know, where he came from, his stance on civil rights would not have been all that popular. And it wasn't, mm -hmm. right? He took a big risk. Uh, that, 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 that's when I just got done reading a biography about him. And, and uh, I think in some ways underappreciated uh, because of other things going on during his administration. But uh, uh, his work in the civil rights movement was, was astounding and, and, and incredibly brave. People like Winston Churchill, uh, who, who were courageous in the face of, of danger, um, uh, people like that are, are, the, are the people that I look to, and, and, and that word hero gets tossed around a lot. It does. Um, but uh, those that are courageous to do what's right, even when the political consequences may be dire, uh, those are my heroes. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about it here. I, can I just say very quickly, uh, we have two candidates running for Secretary of State that are highly qualified, intelligent um, uh, people. And one thing I'm glad about is, uh, regardless of how it falls on election day, I think Ohio is going to be in good hands. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have three heroes I want to mention tonight. They're Kathleen Clyde, David Cohen, and Frank LaRose. <laughs> but also, each of you have been concerned enough about these issues to take time from your lives to be with us tonight. It makes a lot of difference in how our communities live together. Thank each and every one of you for being here, and thank our guests again for being with us. Thank you.